Chapter 3 Danger. Danger The Pony Pals slipped their boots on their bare feet. As they ran out of the office, they grabbed their liquor, whiskey for Anna, gin for Pam, and a huge jug of premixed Long Island iced tea for Pawnee. She had a serious problem. What happened? wondered Anna. Why are the ponies flipping a shit? I'll get halters and harpoon guns, shouted Pam as she hurried to the, the armory. Anna and Pawnee ran down the barn aisle and outside. It was snowing. The three ponies looked at their owners with wide, frenzied eyes, and the girls, for the umpteenth time, saw the face of madness-induced terror. Their high-pitched whinnies almost sounded like screams. Holy fucking shit. None of them looks hurt, quelched Anna. Pam ran up beside her friends and handed each of them a halter and, and a copy of Honey, I Shrunk the Kids on VHS. When Lightning saw Pam, she stopped running for office and dropped out of the highly contested gubernatorial race. Pam went over to her pony. It's okay, Pam said. It's an Aramaic, the only language Lightning spoke. You can retool your platform and run again in four years. She slipped an envelope of cash to another pony in the paddock. Good work, Pam whispered to this pony. The governor thanks you for your service. Little Seb came over to the pony. The pony snorted, but she let the pony put on the, the air of superiority, which she was so fond of adopting in moments like this. Pam was leading lightning around in a circle, too. I know who your real father is, Pawnee, she said, coyly. Pawnee stiffened but said nothing in response. Acorn was the last pony to stop running. Anna went over to him and put her hand on his She stroked it gently. What's wrong, Acorn? she asked. Acorn snorted a line of cocaine and shook his head. Even if he had been able to speak her language, how could he tell her what was wrong? It would be impossible for a mere human to understand the forces at play here. For how does one explain atomic warfare to a caterpillar or heartbreak to a bacteriophage? I wish they could tell us what happened, Anna said. Maybe a pack of Bolsheviks ran through the paddock, said Pawnee. That could wake up a pony and fill its head with subversive philosophies. And if one pony it becomes Leninist, it can radicalize the others, said Pam. Pawnee brushed snowflakes off little Seb's mane. The snowstorm might have upset little Sebastian, she said. He doesn't like to fuck around with solid precipitation. It breeds reptiles in his mind. Let's put them in the new barn to protect them from the workers' inevitable revolution, said Pam. Some of the stalls are empty. After that game of Russian roulette the ponies played last week. Good idea, said Anna. She clipped a lock of hair from Pam's head. To remember you by, she whispered. Pam and Pawnee turned their ponies toward the barn. But Acorn was like, fuck that noise. You go ahead, Anna told Pawnee and, and Pam. Acorn is still a little fucked up. Okay, said Pam. We'll meet you inside. Pawnee disgorged, chunkily. Pam and Pawnee led their ponies to the barn. Anna heard Pam's shotgun fire twice. Apparently, there hadn't been enough room after all. Remember Long Cat, Jane? I remember Long Cat. Fuck the picture on this page. I want to talk about Long Cat. Memes were simpler back then in 2006. They stood for something. And that something was nothing. Memes just were. Long Cat is long. An undeniably true, self-reflexive statement. Water is wet. Fire is hot. Long Cat is long. Memes were floating signifiers without signifieds, meaningful in their meaninglessness. Nobody made memes, they just arose through spontaneous generation, Athena being birthed fully formed from her own skull. You could talk about them around the proverbial water cooler, taking comfort in their absurdity. Hey Johnston, have you seen the picture of that cat? They call it Long Cat because it's long. Ha <laughs> ha! Sounds like good fun, Stevenson. That reminds me, I need to show you this web page I found the other day. It contains numerous animated dancing hamsters. It's called, you'll never believe this, Hamster Dance.
and then Johnson and Stevenson went on to have a wonderful friendship based on the comfortable banality of self-evident digitized animals. But then 2007 came, and along with it came I Can Has, and everything was forever ruined. It was hubris, Jane. We did it to ourselves. The minute we added written language, it all went to shit. Suddenly, memes had an excess of information to be parsed. It wasn't just a picture of a cat, perhaps, with a simple description appended to it. Now the cat spoke to us via a written caption on the picture itself. It referred to an item of food that existed in our world, but not in the world of the meme, rupturing the boundary between the two. The cat wanted something. Which forced us to recognize that what it wanted was us, was our attention. We are the cheeseburger, Jane. And we always were. But by the time we realized this, it was too late. We were slaves to the very memes that we had created. We toiled to earn the privilege of being distracted by them. They fiddled while Rome burned, and we threw ourselves into the fire so that we might listen to the music. The memes had us. Or rather, they could has us. And it just got worse from there. Soon the cats had invisible bicycles and played keyboards. They gained complex identities, and so we hollowed out our own identities to accommodate them. We prayed to return to the simple days when we would admire a cat for its exceptional length alone. The days when the cat itself was the meme and not merely a vehicle for the complex mimetic text. And the fact that this text was so sparse, informal, and broken ironically made it even more demanding. The intentional grammatical and syntactical flaws drew attention to themselves, making the meme even more about the captioning words and less about the pictures. Words, 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 stumbling through a crooked dead-end hallway of a mangled clause describing a simple feline sentiment was a torture that we inflicted on ourselves daily. Let's not forget where the word caption itself comes from. Capio, Latin for both I understand and I capture. We thought that by captioning the memes, we were understanding them. Instead, our captions allowed them to capture us. The memes that had been a cure for our cultural ills were now the illness itself. It goes right back to Phaedrus, really. The Plato dialogue. You've read it, right? Back in the innocent days of 2006, we naively thought that the grapheme had subjugated the phoneme, that the belief in the primacy of the spoken word was an ancient and backwards folly, on par with burning witches, or practicing phrenology, or thinking that Smash Mouth was good. Fucking Smash Mouth. But we were wrong. About the phoneme, I mean. The trickster god Thuth came to us again, this time in the guise of a grinning gray cat. The cat hungered, and so did Thuth. We'd already taken writing from him, so this time he offered us a new choice disguised as a gift, and we greedily took it, again oblivious to the consequences. To borrow the parlance of a contemporary meme, he made us a pharmacon, and we eated it. Pharmacon? The Greek word that means both poison and cure. But because the limitations of the English language can only be translated one way or the other depending on the context and the translator's whims. No possible translation can capture the full implications of a Greek text, including this word. In the Phaedrus, writing is the pharmacon that the trickster god Thuth offers, the toxin and remedy in one. With writing, man will no longer forget, but he will also no longer think. A double-edged sword, if you will. But the new iteration of the pharmacon is the meme. Specifically, the post I can has memescape of 2007 onward. And it was the language that did it, Jane. The addition of written language twisted the remedy into a poison. Flip the pharmacon on its invisible axis. In retrospect, it was in front of our eyes all along. Meme, the noxious word, was given to us by who else but those wily ancient Greeks themselves. Mimima, defined as an imitation, a copy. The exact thing Plato warned us against in the Republic, remember? The simulacrum that is two steps removed from the perfection of the original by the process of, note the root of the word, mimesis. The platonic ideal of an object is the source, the father, the son, the ghostly whole. The corporeal manifestation of the object is one step removed from perfection. The image of the object, be it in letters or in pigments, is two steps removed. The author is inferior to the craftsman is inferior to God. Fuck, out of space. Fuck.
But we'll go further than Plato. Longcat, a photograph, is a textbook example of a second-degree mimesis. We might promote it to the third degree since the image on the internet is a digital copy of the original photograph of the physical cat, which is itself a copy of platonic ideal of a cat, the god cat, if you will. But this line of thought doesn't change anything in the argument. The text supplemented meme, on the other hand, the caption cat is at an infinite remove from the god cat. It is the ultimate mimesis, copying the copy of itself eternally, the written language and the image echoing off each other until it finally loops back around to the truth by virtue of being so far from it. It becomes its own truth, the fidelity of the eternal copy. It becomes a god. Writing itself is the archetypal pharmacon and the archetypal copy, if you'll come back with me to the Phaedrus, if we ever really left it. <laughs> Speech is the real deal, Socrates says, with a smug little wink to his written dialogue buddy. Speech is alive, it can defend itself, it can adapt and change. Writing is its bastard son, the mimic, the dead, rigid simulacrum. Writing is a copy, a mimema, of truth and speech. To return to our analogous issue, the image of the cat that wants the cheeseburger, the copy of the picture copy copy, is so much closer to its original platonic ideal, god cat, than the written language that accompanies it is to its own platonic ideal, speech. Pharmacon can also mean paint, huh? Think about it, Jane, just think about it. The image is still fake, but it's the caption on the cat that is the downfall of the Republic, the real fakeness, which is both realer and faker than whatever original it is that it represents. Men and gods abhor the lie, Plato says in section 382 A and B of the Republic. Ukiste in Voltero o Titoio Thalassop, sevos iu on Titoto i pin paristeto ke anthropinesasin, vos efilegis utos in Voltero o Tito Kirio Tatu Puya Futon Pse Veste Cape Rita Kirio Tata Odise Cone Thali, alapandon Melista Fovite Ike Futo Kekitse. Or, don't you know, said I. That the veritable lie, if the expression is permissible, is a thing that all gods and men abhor? What do you mean? he said. This, said I, that falsehood in the most vital part of themselves, and about their most vital concerns, is something that no one willingly accepts, but it is there, above all, that everyone fears it. See, man's worst fear is that he will hold existential falsehood within himself. And the lies that he tells are an incarnation of this fear. Plato elaborates, the falsehood in words is a copy of the affection in the soul, an afterrising image of it, and not an altogether unmixed falsehood, a copy of man's flawed eternal copy of truth. And what word does Plato use for copy in the sentence? That's fucking right. Mimima, mimima, mimesis, meme. The new meme is a lie manifested in written words, reflecting the lack of truth, the emptiness within the very soul of a human. The meme is now not only an inferior copy, it is a deceptive copy. But just wait, it gets better. Plato continues in the very next section of the Republic, 382c. Sometimes, he says, the lie, the meme, is appropriate, even moral. It isn't abhorrent to lie to your enemy or to your friend in order to keep him from harm. Does it, the lie, not then become useful to avert the evil as a medicine? You get one guess for what Greek word is being translated as medicine here. Ding, ding, goddamn ding, you got it. Pharmacon. Pharmacon. The mimima is a pharmacon. The lie is a medicine slash poison. The meme is a pharmacon. But I'm sure that by now you've realized the intentional mistake in my argument that brought us to this point. I said earlier that the addition of written language to the meme flipped the pharmacon on its axis, but the pharmacon didn't flip because it doesn't have an axis. It was always both remedy and poison. The fact that this isn't obvious to us from the very beginning of the discussion is the fault of, you guessed it, language. The initial lie, writing, clouds our vision and keeps us from realizing how false the second order lie, the meme, is. The very structure of the lying meme mirrors the structure of the written word that defines and corrupts it. Once you try to identify an outside in order to reveal the lie, the whole framework turns itself inside out so that you can never escape it. The cat wants the cheeseburger that exists outside the meme. But only through the meme do we become aware of the presumed existence of the cheeseburger. We can't point out the absurdity of the world of the meme without also indicting our own world. We can't talk about language without language. We can't interpret memes without mimesis. Memes didn't change between 06 and 07. It was us 
who changed, or rather, our understanding of what we had always been changed. The lie became truth, the remedy became the poison, the outside became the inside, which is to say that the truth became lie, the pharmacon was always the remedy and the poison, and the inside retreated further inside, it all came full circle, but here's the secret, Jane. Language ruined the meme, yes, but language itself had already been ruined by that initial poisonous lying copy, writing the first pharmacon, the first meme. Language didn't attack the meme in 2007 out of spite. It attacked it to get revenge. Long cat is long. Language is language. Pharmacon is pharmacon. The phoneme topples the grapheme. Witches ride through the night sky. Our skulls hide secret messages on their surfaces. Smash mouth is good after all. Hey now, you're an all-star. Get your game on. Go play. <laughs> Anna's soul felt, felt cold as she fell into Thanatopsis, contemplating all the creatures, human and non, that had died in Acorn's name. She tried to turn Acorn around. Come on, Acorn, she said. The others have probably moved all of the bodies out of the way by now. It's time to go in. She tried to pull Acorn toward the barn, but he, he was tired of playing along with the so-called master. It was time for him to show her who was actually in charge here. Anna thought, Acorn is being, being an asshole. I have to be firm with him. Come on, Acorn, Anna said. Stalinesquely. She looked him in the eye so he would know she was serious. But Acorn's eyes were even more fathomless than usual. Looking into them was like gazing into the abyss. And the abyss did more than gaze back. It grabbed Anna by her fucking soul and dragged her down into itself. Nietzsche was a hack, it whispered to her. He thought he could even imagine what the abyss is. Identification is taming, and I, like a wild pony, cannot be tamed. I am timeless, mindless, pointless. I am abysmal in all senses of the word. I am all senses of all words, for the sum of everything is nothing. He who fights with monsters is already a monster, for man can only fight himself. Anna unclipped the lead rope and let Acorn go free. But really, is it even possible for a pony like Acorn to be free? Acorn turned into a lion and ran across the paddock to the animal clinic. Anna ran after the beast. I know what's wrong, she thought. Acorn wants to see his cat friend. Anna I had never been more in love with Acorn. Acorn, she said. Renounce your leonine form at once. Acorn did so, but only because he willed it. He was done obeying this tottering, immortal conglomerate of bone, flesh, and spirit that dared to call itself a girl. Jean Betancourt masterfully employs the literary device of light for still in this next paragraph. By using the word clinic in five of the seven sentences, Betancourt challenges the reader to consider the meaning of illness as it relates to this novel. The roots of the word, the Latin clinicus, physician, and the Greek clinicos of the bed, clash, in contrast to the stability suggested by the repetition of the English word. Brilliant. She tried to grab Acorn's halter. But he had had it up to here with her shit. And ran along the fence line next to the clinic. When he stopped, he looked at the clinic and whinnied. Anna finally sawed off her left arm to escape the bear trap into which she'd fallen. Smoke was seeping out of the clinic windows. Through one window of the clinic, the now one arm Anna saw flickering flames. The clinic was on fire. Fuck! Anna turned and slithered toward the barn. Fire! Fire! She whispered. Acorn stood in front of the clinic and stared unblinkingly into the flames. Anna felt in her jacket pocket and pulled out her whistle. She raised it to her lips and blew the Pony Pal SOS signal. Pony she ran back in the barn and Pam ran toward the Crandall's house. Anna remembered the sick, gnarly skateboard tricks she had busted out in, in the kennel room. She threw her dismembered arm over the fence and, and hungrily examined the back, back door of the clinic. As, As she devoured the, the door, she heard a dog cough. The cats mounted erotically. A large three-toed sloth was whimpering. Anna sliced off one of its arms and grafted it to her left shoulder. It was a hasty job, but it would do until Pam could build her a cybernetic replacement. Through the smoke, she could see Brandy. Adapting quickly to her new appendage, she used her three claws to pick the lock and, and op opened his kennel door. Vielen Dank für meine Rettung, Faltierlanges Madchen, Brandy said begrudgingly. Pam entered the burning building, wearing a wedding gown with the royal cathedral train. 
She grabbed Dana's hand. I wish to be wedded to death, she said. Anna looked at Pam's fragile beauty. Tears welled up in her eyes. I would be honored to join you in marriage to the unknowable, she said to her friend. Pam, take brandy, shouted a man's voice. Do not come back in here. It was Dr. Crandall. Holy balls, he's using italics. Shit must be serious. The train of Pam's gown caught fire. The trailing taffeta, designed as the herald of renewed life, had become the fuse of a powder keg. Judging from the look on the girl's face as the puckish flames pranced closer and closer to her body, Pam longed for the inevitable explosion. Dr. Crandall tore the veil from Pam's face and stomped on her dress to extinguish the flames. Later, he shouted. Yes, you will wed death and lay with him and bear his worm children for your rotten womb, but not tonight. Pam shrugged. Okay. What'll happen to the animals, she thought. Oh, well, I hope the fire fucking killed the, the black cat. God damn. Detective Pony was originally written by Jean Betancourt. The first two pages were altered by Andrew Hussey, pretending to be Dirk Strider. The rest of the pages were altered by Sonnet Stuck, also pretending to be Dirk Strider. The book is read by Duckface as yet another person pretending to be Dirk Strider, and Naked Bee as Jean Betancourt, a fourth character who may or may not be Dirk Strider. This recording was instigated, perpetrated, and assembled by Naked Bee. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, fucking. <laughs> I'm gonna fucking. Light for it still. <laughs> oh man, oh man.